parti. Par contre, je m'entends. <rire> ok, bonjour à tout le monde. Hello everyone. Le webinaire, la vidéoconférence de clôture du forum des luttes. The webinar took place, the forum of fights has now begun. We'll just wait for a few more participants to arrive. Que les il est 14h03. I'm just waiting for more people to arrive. It's 14.03. For the people who are already here, you have interpreting available in Spanish, French, English and Portuguese. There's a small globe at the bottom right of your Zoom screen that says interpreting. Bonjour. Nous allons commencer dans deux minutes. We'll start in two minutes. Pour les gens qui arrivent, vous avez la possibilité d'avoir un interprète. For the people who are just arriving, you have the possibility to listen to the interpretation in English, French, Spanish and Portuguese simultaneously. Nous avons tout le monde. Everyone's here. Okay. Okay. Est-ce que je peux demander à l'équipe technique de mettre... Ah non, ça y est, je l'ai trouvé. Voilà. Bonjour à tout le monde. Donc, on laissera les gens... Hello, everyone. Um, people are still arriving. Welcome to this closing, uh, this closing session of the third discussion of our forum for the struggles for land and natural resources. We have a webinar format this time. We had a video conference for the, the last sessions, but we had a small issue with some trolls in the last video conference. So we've moved into this webinar mode, but we'll have more or less an hour of presentations with the different speakers that I'll introduce to you. And then we'll give you the floor to ask questions, participate, and you can also uh, make analyses and raise your hand if you want to speak and we'll give you uh, the floor to turn on your microphone and your camera. So this is the closing session of our series of discussions based on how peasant mobilization is changing 
farming. We began our discussion on the 19th of March and talked about ways that we can change governance from bottom up. Our actions are based on mobilization um, that we've seen on the ground to obtain a change in agricultural governance. So today we've got lots of great speeches. We'll have an introduction to put the role of peasant movements in Europe um, in perspective. Then we'll move on to Attila, who is a member of ECVC and will also give a speech to present the work that he has done on the European directives. Then we have uh, Rose Corbett from the Workers' Alliance who will talk about a financial reform which happened in Scotland under the oppression of peasant movements. And we have Mikhailo from Ukraine, who isn't a, a farmer like the other panelists, but who is a researcher and analyst on the question of land grabbing. He's part of Eco Action in Ukraine. So Hill also talked about uh, the problems which are very connected to current affairs today. So today he can focus on the agricultural reform in Ukraine, what the financial landscape looks like in Ukraine and what actions we can see after the current conflict. So I've um, introduced the panelists, but not in the right order. So firstly, we'll go to Attila, who will deal with finance, finances, then Rose from Scotland. Uh, are you sure that that's right? We said Misha and then Rose, and then we'll finish with Attila. Ah, OK. Sorry. On commence par Misha. So we can start with Misha. So we don't have live uh, presentations. He'll speak without a presentation. So uh, Misha, you can speak. Uh, I, can, I can start. <coughs> Uh, Fanny, du coup, c'est bon. Vas-y. Uh, okay, so Fanny, you, you start. Discussion avant que la guerre en Ukraine n'éclate et que les enjeux géopolitiques actuels viennent bousculer nos organisations. We imagined this discussion before the war broke out in Ukraine. But we don't want to open debate on the conflict because we don't think that's the objective of this forum. So we're very happy to have Misha with us today, a Ukrainian campaigner who's going to talk about the financial landscape in his country and explain how farmers can organize in times of war, how they can change food supply and production. We would like to, you to respect the choice that we've made to talk about finance. We hoped to organize this discussion about financial issues in Europe because often in international meetings, farm organizations only find support postures without being able to give witness to our realities here in Europe. ou broyé par le rouleau compresseur de l'agroindustrie. 
Cette discussion, on l'espère, va justement mettre en lumière le fait que le modèle agricole dominant en Europe n'est vraiment pas un exemple à suivre. The dominating agricultural model in Europe shouldn't, isn't good to follow. Et nous continuons de le faire pour la mise en place d'outils de régulation pour une, pour une meilleure gouvernance frontière. Il faut rappeler un peu le contexte européen. We need to remember the European context. After the Second World War, policy was founded on liberal ideas. La politique agricole commune au sein des pays membres de l'Union européenne a été créé pour aller aussi dans ce sens. Course à la production, course à l'agrandissement et course aux subventions pour les paysans devenus Annie, des chefs d'exploitation. Oui. est-ce que tu peux parler un tout petit peu plus lentement pour les interprètes Ok. Merci. La pollution et la malbouffe engendrée par toutes ces politiques, une des conséquences... One of the disastrous consequences of liberal policies has really been an erosion of the population. Between 2007 and 2017, we've lost over 3 million farmers in Europe. For example, in France, we went from 2.3 million farms in 1955 to only 390,000 in 2020. Our elders fought for tools but that's not enough. We need to be strong and propose new tools to be voted on and implemented. La liste fait des espérances de toutes les conséquences que ces politiques engendrent est non exhaustive. Par exemple, capitalisation et spéculation sur le prix des terres, concentration des capitaux, et des terres dans les mains des plus gros, ouverture des marchés nationaux et internationaux à l'accaparement des terres, bétonisation des sols pour de grands projets d'aménagement, production d'agrocarburants et perte de la vocation alimentaire de la terre, à l'inverse, financiarisation de la nature et sanctuarisation d'espaces naturels où les activités paysannes et pastorales n'auraient plus de place, processus de compensation carbone qui, en plus d'être le bras armé du greenwashing, peut devenir un piège pour les paysans en se substituant aux revenus agricoles. Rose Dekos, en plus de nous parler de la réforme foncière écossaise, illustrera comment les crédits carbone sont en train de changer les modalités d'accès aux fonciers. Attila, de Roumanie, viendra conclure cette série de témoignages au nom de la coordination européenne de la Campesina, en nous expliquant pourquoi nous organisons depuis plusieurs années des échanges avec des organisations alliées et des juristes pour tenter de dessiner une directive foncière européenne puisse ce projet apporter un souffle nouveau et inciter nos gouvernements à plus de régulation foncière afin de répondre aux enjeux climatiques, sociaux, environnementaux, alimentaires, d'aménagement du territoire, de vie en milieu rural. La question foncière est aussi une question sociale. La souveraineté foncière est un socle pour pouvoir construire la souveraineté alimentaire. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Fanny. Euh, je... Thank you, Fanny. Now I'll give the floor to Michaelo, but I would just ask panelists, I know you're all very passionate because this is a, a very passionate subject, but this is very hard for interpreters if you speak too quickly. So please try to speak a little slower for, for the interpreters. Um, yeah, uh, thank you and uh, hello everybody. Um, I, I will be not so fast. <laughs> Tentarei 
So, yeah, my name is Mikhail Amoso. I'm representing here EcoAction. It's a CSO organization from Ukraine. Before the war, uh, we were based in Kyiv, but now our all our staff dispersed around uh, Ukraine and uh, European Union as well. And part of uh, half of our staff in uh, now in Belgium, Czech Republic, Poland, uh, Slovenia, France, so really dispersed. And uh, I uh, work in as a head of greening, uh, industry greening department and uh, industry greening means that for us means that we are working on agricultural issue. And uh, first of all, it's uh, environmental pollution caused by uh, big agribusinesses in Ukraine. And also it's air pollution uh, from huge industry. And uh, why we combined to these uh, parts, because agriculture in Ukraine is same as huge big industry. So it's really a large scale uh, production and we just combine it in one department in our organization. Also, uh, EcoAction covering other directions. Uh, other, we have other campaigns like climate change campaign, uh, anti-nuclear campaign, and uh, yes, our main campaigns. Uh, for now, before, yeah, <laughs> would be better to say before the war because now we are more focused on energy security and food security, because as you may know, Russia is really well fueled by money from uh, energy, from fossil fuels to European Union, first of all. And I'm focused on food security and land relations and how it was uh, impacted by war since the beginning. So before the war, I was like, uh, uh, slightly worked on land relations, land investment in Ukraine and sustainable agriculture in Ukraine. Um, yeah, and we are we were following uh, uh, yeah land grab cases in Ukraine and land reform. It's yeah, it's more not about agricultural reform. It's more about land reform, and it uh, as I, as for now it's. Uh, I think longest land reform in the world. It's uh, because it started in 1991 and uh, it's keep going uh, till now. So what, um, yeah, what about this land reform? And uh, since Soviet Union collapsed, a lot of people uh, received their land plots because it's like, uh, uh, how to say equal equality uh, justice yeah uh, justice for these people who work in collective farms and they just receive their land plots but uh, there was there were like a lot of obstacles to work on these land plots and uh, because people uh, farm uh, family farms small farmers didn't have a lot of capacity financial capacity knowledge how to work with this land and uh, also um, uh, often these land plots received were really far from their homes sometimes 10 or 15 kilometers from their homes and it was impossible to work effectively effectively on these uh, land plots additionally it can be it could be one like land plot can can be in the middle of huge field for 200 hectares for example and uh, for example my parents uh, have their land plots and it's actually in the middle of the field and it's not accessible for farming yeah, and it's like usual situation around ukraine and uh, People worked in collective farms, received in average four hectares. And on Western Ukraine, it's uh, one hectare. And on Eastern and Southern Ukraine, it uh, can be 13 or 15 hectares in average. So in Ukraine, average is like four hectares. And it was 7 million people received such land plots. And uh, then what happened then? Uh, the Ukrainian government wanted to avoid land grabbing, yeah, land concentration by uh, big business. And they established a so-called land moratorium 
and they just banned uh, all land sales in Ukraine. So only one way to get land for operation, for farming, became land leasing. So all these 7 million people just uh, gave this uh, land to lease to other private companies, which could operate on this land. And uh, yeah, actually, land moratorium, this ban on land sales, didn't do what that need to do actually to avoid, yeah, to avoid land concentration by big business and actually through long term lease agreements, um, private business accumulated a lot a lot of lands in their hands like one by one 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 land plot by another and they just collect thousands and millions of hectares uh, of these uh, land plots uh, in tens like actually tens hands and uh, this uh, land moratorium was working till uh, 2021 and the uh, new government was like able to lift this moratorium and uh, uh, start free land market in Ukraine. But uh, even so, it, it has some limitations like new and new land market, so-called free land market also has limitations to buy land by private legal entities and only uh, private people, regular people, farmers, uh, can buy this land and uh, only from 2024 legal entities can buy land plots and uh, yeah we should see how it will happen because in February Russia invaded Ukraine and everything changed actually land reform actually lost it uh, I don't know how to say goals and uh, aims uh, because this first stage of land reform it's a uh, government wanted to give small farmers and medium farmers this opportunity to buy land before legal entities will come up to buy land and uh, actually since last year there was no big rush for land to buy land and uh, uh, land lease rent uh, still really popular in Ukraine and once uh, war started it's now impossible to buy land and even to conclude any other agreement on land so like everything frozen <clears throat> because it's a uh, kind of danger to conclude such uh, agreements between people or between even legal entities in Ukraine for now because of danger of cyber attack by uh, by Russians in Ukraine. So every register on private property now turned off, closed for everybody and only government officials can get this, uh, can do something with this information. And also we like uh, non-governmental organization cannot follow what is going on with uh, land for now. And uh, here we, we come to re new reality for, for farmers, small farmers, family farmers in Ukraine because of uh, war actually as such, like ev everything changed. And uh, as you may know, Ukraine usually export a lot, a lot of grain to different countries of the world. And there is huge dependence on our grains in African countries or Asian countries. And the, the Ukraine is a huge player on this grain market. And uh, small farmers what, like, weren't included in, in this, in this uh, process to export huge amounts of grains uh, to abroad. So it seems like for big agribusinesses, all their logistic chains, uh, supply chains completely destroyed uh, or at least disrupted. And uh, it's impossible to do export abroad from Ukrainian seaports as it's blocked and mined by Russians. And uh, it's impossible to do, in the, I mean, in such uh, big portions to do this export by railway or even uh, 
auto transport to do it through our western border <clears throat> and uh, because of this as we lost our export opportunity uh, we now see this ukraine's huge dependence on this money uh, usually coming to ukraine from this export and now we see this big opportunity for small and uh, medium sized farmers to come up with their opportunity to better adapt with better adaptation to new conditions but uh, in any case they need support and now we are looking for opportunities actually in ukraine how to help government uh, understand that they should pay attention not only for for big agribusiness with which have which has like a lot of uh, representatives in government actually and farmers don't have such uh, support uh, directly in government and uh, yeah and uh, most like hard situation for farmers and uh, even for big agribusiness also is uh, on already occupied territory by russians or contested areas so for us in ukraine now uh, the situation with access to land because of war is like really limited access to this land so even you if you uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't know how, how to be, how better to say. So if usually it was easy to get your field, now you cannot do this because a lot of uh, weapons on your fields, like your field can be mined and uh, you don't have enough fuel to get there. So <clears throat> and if you if even if you can harvest your field, somewhere somewhere in summer it's impossible to realize this food so it's like uh, farmers and uh, every business uh, agribusiness just in, in uh, just stalled in the stuck in their situation to work on land and operate this land and yes for first uh, like estimation it's around 30 percent of agricultural land in ukraine uh, is not like accessible for operation and uh, yeah we don't know what will happen next and uh, because uh, at least free from occupation territory area like uh, is able to cover Ukraine's need in food, and it's easy yeah, to fill this gap in food for Ukraine. But uh, we are not sure about other countries depend dependent now on our uh, grain export. So I see that uh, farmers actually in process of adaptation, uh, they ad adapt their uh, crop structure, crop rotation to more uh like diversified style not only sunflower corn and wheat but also about buckwheat uh, uh, beans like not only soybeans yeah and uh, <clears throat> so a lot of farmers actually looking for support in, uh, in seeds in fuels fertilizers and even even pesticides as like everything destroyed by by this war and um yeah and uh, so here's like main uh, um, issue yeah might, might be interested for you this access to land so because of war you can do your usual stuff as you cannot uh, assess access your your land and uh, it's 10 million hectares now in ukraine and we don't know what is happening like only a few news uh, coming from this occupied territory for example in Kherson oblast it's around 2000 farmers uh, working there and uh, <clears throat> uh, only few news i i saw that they started their sowing campaign so it's a huge uh, obstacle for them to do this sowing campaign this year and uh, yeah actually 
it's difficult to get any information from them because they just uh, cut it from other parts of Ukraine and uh, they just became part of resistance on this on these territories, Kherson, the Parisian Oblast, they are just part of resistance to Russian occupation now, and uh, we are not sure they can do the usual work. And uh, what about other parts of Ukraine? It's just uh, uh, a lot of men actually mobilized to army and because of war, actually, and uh, it's also a big issue. And the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense Pants and Ministry of Agriculture just trying to find this better way to communicate between them to to do like uh, yeah to to do sovereign campaign in better way yeah to secure our uh, country like build food security and uh, yeah it's also a big issue for now so yeah something like that I uh, would like. Uh, to share with you and if you have uh, more questions i'm ready to answer and uh, share what i know yeah thank you merci beaucoup uh, je suis sûr qu'il y aura des, des questions thank et... you i'm sure there'll be questions and comments you can ask questions or make comments on Zoom, either in the chat box, or there's also a Q&A box where you can leave your questions. We'll allocate them to the different speakers. You can do this throughout the presentations. I've seen a couple of people have raised their, ma their hands. We'll answer questions after the speeches. Now I'll give the floor over to Rose Corbett from the Workers' Alliance. Thanks, Audrey. Um, thanks as well so much, Makelo, for um, yeah, giving your time today. Um, it's really, um, yeah, it's really good to hear. Well, it's, it's yeah, <laughs> it's good to have an update on um, how things are happening in Ukraine and um uh what uh kind of pointing towards what support uh might be offered to farmers there um i've got slides Adrian, tu, peux, tu peux lancer la, la la présentation de rose le pdf en anglais merci yeah, perfect thank you um yeah so i'm my name is Roz and I'm a market gardener and a beekeeper. Uh, and I also am on the coordinating group for the Land Workers Alliance, which is a, a UK wide union of agroecological uh, land workers, for farmers, foresters, and growers. Um, and I'm based in Scotland and I'm going to talk today about some of the uh, land reform agenda, which is uh, an interesting land struggle um, that's been happening specifically in Scotland. Um, and yeah, I, I'm just going to give a pretext to that as well, that um, something that uh, I think Makarov also said that the, the land reform work that's happened in Scotland is, um, is not uh, not framed as an agricultural reform, but uh, is about land reform for rural communities that has turned into a bigger land reform process. So um, it's not framed as an agricultural reform, but it has lots of consequences for agricultural land, obviously. Um, and I just wanted to also situate the, this in um, the history of uh, land uh, expropriation and exploitation in Scotland, because I think it's really important to bear in mind that history and, and acknowledge it and acknowledge the impact of that history outside of the UK and on the, on the rest of the world. Um, so Scotland has one of the largest, constant, most concentrated land ownership structures in, in Europe, apparently, though I think it's possibly um, changing with some of the dynamics that are happening in uh, Eastern European countries at the moment. Um, but uh, 
yeah, um, this history of concentrated land structure really comes out of the um, sort of 17th and 18th century land grabs by um, large estate owners in, in Scotland. Um, and um, some of you might be aware of the history of the clearances uh, where rural communities who were largely self-sufficient at the time were forcibly cleared off their land and into either urban areas or um, moved abroad to other countries like Australia and Canada. Uh, and these land grabs were um, done by large estate owners from both Scotland and England. Um, and there's a recent research report that's shown that the cash that was used to do those land purchases was often linked to um, the Abolition of Slavery Act, which was an act whereby the UK government compensated slave owners for the loss of their property, that is people, um, and gave them the cash value of those people. And then that money was used to purchase land in the Highlands and then clear off the rural populations that were already there. So that's a, a history that we're dealing with um, and one that sort of continues to play out in the land dynamics that we have today. Um, and yeah, there's a, a report that I've got a link to at the end that is really worthwhile reading in terms of how that historical context um, influences our land structure today. And it's still very much framed around a sort of global export uh, and exploitative economic model. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so yeah, this is roughly what our land ownership structure looks like in Scotland today. Um, we have a really agricultural, um, uh, Scotland's predominantly agricultural land, um, though a lot of that is uh, sort of less favoured area type land, so hill farming and um, forestry as well. And yeah, as I said, it's got a highly concentrated land ownership structure and um, a lot of the large landowners are private landowners, though some of them are public landowners or um, charity NGO bodies. And that uh, structure, land ownership structure is historical, but it is something that is um, increasing at the moment. So we're still seeing now increasing consolidation of land ownership in Scotland. Uh, and that's happening with farm sizes and is partly driven by uh, the subsidy regime and other, um, other finance regimes that are happening, which I'll touch on later on in the, in the presentation. Next slide. <clears throat> and I just wanted to say a little bit about the sort of demographics of, um, of farming in Scotland at the moment as a context. So we um, have an increasingly aging population of farmers. I think the average age is around 60. Um, and that uh, very few people under the age of 41. And that uh, sort of this, this shape diagram keeps getting more and more like this. So, so like um, more and more aging over time. Um, <clears throat> and we're, we're losing full-time farmers uh, each year. So roughly like 500 farmers each year are moving out of full-time employment. Some of them are moving into part-time employment or more seasonal um, informal employment. Um, but yeah, overall kind of a loss to the, uh, the farming workforce. And um, a lot of the farming at the moment is very uh, industrial and large scale and heavily reliant on the subsidy system to break even. Um, and um, it's also very reliant on an export model. So most of what we produce is um, is arable or uh, hill farming. And most of the arable production is for whiskey and biscuits. And we have lovely whiskey, but it also means that we're uh, heavily reliant on importing fruit and vegetables and uh, other food for human consumption. Um, next slide. 
So this overall ownership structure means that land access for people that want to farm um, agroecologically or, or in any way, but um, agroecologically in particular is a struggle. Um, we did some research with the Scottish Farmland Trust, uh, who I'm involved with uh, about four or five years ago to ask people what the main barriers were to them starting farming agroecologically. Uh, and the, uh, this is on the right hand side, the top right hand side here is some of the results from that. So most people said that they wanted to farm agroecologically, but access to land was the biggest barrier uh, and then housing and profitability wasn't so much an issue for them because they're really driven by ecological motivations to start farming uh, and were kind of willing to um, live a lower income life in order to farm in that way. Why is land access such a struggle? We've got like a lot of different dynamics going on in the land market that make land access a struggle apart from the, the highly con concentrated land ownership structure. So at the moment we have very few um, farms actually for sale each year. Um, it's roughly a hundred farms each year are for sale in the open market. Um, a lot of those sales go to existing farmers who want to consolidate their, um, their existing farm business and so they're uh, outcompeting new entrants. And also some of those sales are going to non-farmers for investment for tax reasons or for benefits related to other um, financial benefits that you get from owning farmland in Scotland. Um, and so this drives speculation in the in the land market, the sort of financial benefits that we have. And over the last, um, there's there's really different figures on this actually, and this is the most extreme figure that I found. Just to um, clarify that, but um, this one figure that the value of agricultural land in the UK in in total uh, has risen by 462% um, in the 10 year period, uh, just over under a decade ago. So we're really seeing like an increase in the price of land, which makes it inaccessible for people with less capital. And so for people with less capital, you might think that tenancies is an option for accessing land for farming, but also we see an, an overall reduction in the availability of te farm tenancies and an increasing insecurity of the, the tenancies that are available. So they're shorter term tenancies, often five to 10 years um, or even less. Um, next slide. <clears throat> and the impact for this on the food sovereignty movement in Scotland is really uh, one of marginalisation, and that's cultural and economic. Um, I've put this picture of these sheep here, which are a specific breed from an island in the Orkneys, and they just eat seaweed and they only live on the uh, beaches of the island. And I, I think it's a really good metaphor for the sort of food sovereignty and agroecology movement, because we're really sort of pushed to the edges of marginal land um, where, where things are really difficult to be economically viable. Um, and a lot of Land Workers Alliance members have a very informal uh, land tenure access, so they have verbal agreements with the landowners. Um, and that means that they can't access the capital to invest in their businesses, for example, by installing micro dairy systems um, and milking parlors and things like that to be able to make their businesses more viable. And it's also a big social justice issue if we're only relying on a system that um, where farmers access land from uh, private purchase. That means that we're rolling, ruling out a whole uh, load of people who can't afford to buy land. Um, and really need to address that social justice issue. Next slide. So that was just a bit of context. Um, and uh, and um, is sort of led to a real push from the grassroots uh, for uh, the importance of land reform in Scotland to change, try and change this concentrated land ownership structure and shift the dynamics of the market. Um, and before a devolution to Scotland, we did have a, a really strong but small movement of community landowners who were purchasing um, land and estates of absentee landowners, um, especially notoriously like 
egg and the Asint Foundation in the Highlands. And this grassroots movement for community buyouts of that land really pushed the agenda um, for the current land reform movement that we have in Scotland at the moment. And this critical political point in time happened um, in 1999 when the UK government gave uh, devolved power to the Scottish Parliament to um, make its own legislation around land. And that was really used as a trigger to then push this uh, quite a radical land reform agenda for Scotland. So uh, the, the first piece of legislation that came in was the abolition of feudal tenure in 2000. So we still had feudal tenure in Scotland until, uh, until 2000. And this was basically a system where um, yeah, if uh, an owner of the land died, then it just the, the ownership rights went to the first son of the family and wasn't split up so that's helped that kind of maintain this kind of ownership structure that we have today along with other things and then we had a whole raft of other legislation and it's a very um there's a, a lot of different elements to the legislation and i'm happy to talk about it in more detail um but i'm just going to cover some of the key points that i think are interesting here um, so in 2003 the land reform the first land reform act brought in the right to roam so people can go anywhere, they can walk anywhere, um, as long as they do that responsibly and not in someone's private garden. Um, and that's a cult, like a real cultural sort of um, shift in terms of how people think about their connection to land. Uh, and then we uh, also uh, created legislation around the community right to buy so that communities had a clear process for buying land from uh, landowners. So this wasn't um, this was a retrospective like right to buy. So you register an interest in the land, and when it comes up for sale, you can then uh, have first uh, like put in the first bids for that land. Um, and we and then the Community Empowerment uh, Scotland Act in 2015 uh, made some changes to the first Community Empowerment Act to expand it to the whole of Scotland because it was just in rural areas before then. And then in 2016, the next Land Reform Act um, looked at measures to increase the sort of governance, improve the governance of uh, land in Scotland by creating the Scottish Land Commission, um, and also created the community right to buy, which is an absolute right to buy. Um, so communities can force the sale of land from an owner um, if they can prove that it is for sustainable development. And this is a really significant piece of legislation, but it's not really been used yet. And we're trying to um, understand why. Um, and as you can see by the graph on the bottom right hand side, this has led to a real increase in the number of community landowners in Scotland now. So there's um, 400, over 400 community landowners over owning over 500 assets um, and they're using that land in a number of different ways and some of them are using it for agriculture and and kind of transforming the agricultural systems that they have in their uh, in their local communities next slide uh, so these are just some of the examples i'll talk about really quickly um, uh, so there's some island communities here that have done buyouts um, and Westray up in Orkney and uh, Collinsay in the um, Southern Hebrides. Um, and next slide for agriculture. Uh, and then also some communities are buying out woodland as well and um, doing that, uh, using that ownership to create more uh, sustainable woodland management as well, which is um, significant in a way. Next slide. Um, so it's a really positive and interesting model. And I think it's something that um, is uh, possibly useful in other countries and contexts, but it is limited as well in terms of what the community uh, community land ownership is able to achieve uh, in the wider dynamic of the land market and land system that we have. Um, and I just want to sort of point to some challenges as a as a concluding 
bit of this presentation. Um, so the community right to buy mostly is uh, not is designed not to be reactive. So if a local community sees that a piece of land is going to be sold to a landowner for a certain price and they don't want that landowner to buy that land, they want to take it for themselves. They can't really act in the current legislation. It's not meant to be reactive in that way. Um, and yet that's often when communities realize that they don't want to lose um, the land, the farm that's serving their community to a private company. Um, and, and so the legislation doesn't really enable that at the moment and is, is really slow and clunky and complicated. Um, and there's a, a justification for that around human rights, but there's a lot of work at the moment to kind of unpick that, whether that's reasonable application of human rights law um and yeah this still so communities are still really at a disadvantage to wealthy elites who have the cash to buy the land at whatever price they can afford it um so we still see the speculation in the land market the the rise in prices um and the community right to buy is is maybe not uh, sort of enough of a measure to to stop that kind of land speculation and consolidation at the moment so possibly what we need is something where there's a, an intervention in the land market uh, or more regulation of the land market in order to slow it down and to, um, to, to kind of keep a check on the price and uh, decision making around the type of land use that's available. And we're seeing this as a real challenge at the moment because of the carbon credit system that is uh, sort of un very unregulated in Scotland and is um, there's been a number of sort of high profile land purchases over the last two years by um, by companies and private landowners who are seeking to uh, benefit from this carbon credit system for carbon offsetting and I just uh, have one example here. Um, from Brewdog, who uh, brew beer, uh, it's quite a like trendy company, uh, doing really well. Um, but they are purchasing quite a few estates around Scotland um, to plant trees to offset the carbon emissions from their um, their beer, their brewery making industry, uh, and um, have been criticised as well because some of those. Uh, purchases have they've then evicted the tenants that have been on there who have been either farming or um, gamekeepers are present so it's it's kind of are we coming full circle again with the clearances um, where um, kind of entrepreneurs are coming in and buying land and clearing off the existing residents for financial benefit um, so that's a kind of concluding challenge from me uh and next slide yeah i um i think these slides are going to be shared but i just wanted to share these um documents for further reading for anyone that's interested um so yeah i'll stop there thanks very much um and yeah happy to take questions at the end merci beaucoup rosa oui, yeah, thank you ross We've had a few questions during your presentation. Uh, we'll ask you them in just a moment. I'd just like to finish with the last speech from Attila, and then we'll move on to the several questions which have been asked about your presentations. Uh, thank you, Ros. Uh, Attila, I'll give you the floor and ask for the technical team to share your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Audrey. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, just not, yes, great, because sometimes rural internet is really bad. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Attila Such. I'm coming from uh, Romania. I'm a peasant farmer uh, practicing agroecology in Transylvania. Uh, and I'm also president of Eco Ruralis, which is a national peasant farmers association in Romania. Also, I'm a member of the coordination committee of the European Coordination Via Campesina, working a lot on, on, the, on the issue on the right to land 
and also on public policies. Um, I I'm I just wanted to uh, thank you a lot. Uh, first of all, Mikhailo, and then thank you a lot to Rose for uh, the presentation. It was a very interesting, interesting um, journey throughout uh, East to West. Uh, I think one of the aim was to to have uh, have this kind of East West balance already put into the discussion. And my role is to uh, is to fill it in with the rest of Europe a little bit, and. Uh, Indeed, the, the, the idea of today's webinar was to see how we mobilize, rise up from our struggles and engage into policymaking and, and, and even conceive our own policies and we push them through the political systems. And just wanted to emphasize from the beginning and to give our solidarity with Ukraine and with Mikhailo and others and the small farmers who are, who are fighting but also producing on their land because we can change policy in peacetime. And it's very important that we all militate for peace in all regions, especially in Ukraine right now, and to give soli international solidarity to, to, to us ourselves, to the peasants all over the world, and now the peasants to Ukraine, so that we can fight for peace and amend our legislation, fight for a better legislation on land in peacetime. Um, wanted to share with you, um, the work that we have been doing on uh, on, a, on a European level in the in the in La Via Campesina Europe, where uh, where um, I'm sorry I was seeing the chat and I saw my name Otita but I can answer that later. Where we have been working on uh, a proposal, a peasant proposal coming out of the the heart and the soul and the experience of peasantry in Europe, uh, and proposing a directive on land. And one would ask, why would we need a directive, like a piece of legislation, a European legislation right now in, in Europe? Well, especially when I'm talking right now about the European Union and why we would need to propose something like this to the European Union level. Um, but why? Because we have seen through this forum several times how other regions from other continents are fighting and struggling for land because they have huge problems on land. And the same reality is in Europe. We have been highlighting since a long time the problem and the huge issue of land grabbing, especially in the Eastern European side, but not just. Ross was talking about the enclosures and was talking about the concentration of land and the very policies that are very neoliberal, but also very focused on just property instead of stewardship of land and neglect a lot the commons, neglect a lot the power of the peasant farmers to access land, and it's generating a lot of land concentration and, and uh, a lot of land speculation, but also a lot of land amendment, because also Ross was mentioning, and it's a European reality, that, uh, uh, that this uh, shrinking of farmer effectives, Europe is losing farmers, and any future policy needs to create more farmers, not less farmers. So that is why also we wanted to propose and to work politically as European uh, Coordination Via Campesina on proposing a directive to land. Also because there's no such cohesive EU regulation on land. And also because there, there are precedents on a European level and we can see that also from the ground that there is, for instance, the, the directive on, on water, uh, which is also a natural resource like land. Uh, and because we believe, and to our assessments, uh, we think that a, a directive can be a very powerful legal instrument to give direction for the land market on, in the European Union, but also having an effect on the extra community market, on the extra European Union market. And it's also, we wanted to engage into this process of creating this piece of legislation that is an articulation of our will, of our, what we want. So this is a bottom-up empowerment process through articulating, even through a legislation, what we want on land, we became powerful. We practice our voice from the ground and we do what lobbies do, but without, uh, without the lobbies don't have the connection with the land. We have our everyday connection with the land and we want to push that towards the policymakers because, and our final cherry on the top of our land cake is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants. Because in that declaration that we long fight for as a global movement of La Via Campesina, we see as, and there's an article dedicated for land as a right, 
So if there's a land as a right that needs to be implemented in European legislation. Next slide, please. Um, if, uh, yes, thank you. So basically I will present two, two aspects of our, our uh, work. One is the history. I will not, I will be briefer on that and more visual. And I will also actually put out to you the, the text that we have been working on and the political conviction behind it. Next slide, please. So on the, on the, on the history of the work, we, as I've been saying, uh, Via Campesina Europe has been working a lot on land grabbing. We have been partnering up with, uh, with allies from Europe, and we have been documenting a lot the issue of land grabbing, which is huge in Europe. In Europe, uh, large tracts of land are being concentrated. Mikhailo was very well saying it in Ukraine, which is often overlooked, even in peace times. And right now we are talking about Romania, where already 4 million hectares of land are in the, in the patrimony of big investment funds and banks and all kinds of big industrial players. And this, we see this trend everywhere repeating in Europe. So we started documenting this trend. And uh, we started to, when we started to articulate our political viewpoints, we also started to work with academics, especially academics who were like activist researchers and activist academics who were supporting us to articulate our, our language, our peasant language also in a legal way. And then also we had a lot of bilateral meetings in the ECVC constituency with our membership. So we never lose ground than the realities. And we also did a series of webinars between us. And of course, this was a constant work of the, the, the work of the land working group uh, of the ECVC. So if you can go to the next slide, please. I just wanted to briefly show the results of this work, or this historical work. There's a lot of documentation and these are very widespread good tools, good reports that we created, one that is outlining the, the transparency behind the land concentration, what's happening with land, what's happening with land grabbing in Europe. We outlined that it's a huge deal. Then we propose solutions, practical solutions. So how, what can communities do, peasant communities do through the sector? And the your land, my land, our land, which we created in the Yeleni uh, uh, Europe uh, network, we started to really propose solutions uh, and examples from the ground or what we farmers are doing on the ground. Then on the roots of resilience, we really put on the table already the policy behind uh, the, the directive on land. We share there why it's important to work on, on the land policy so that we can have an agroecological transition. So if you go to the next slide, please. That all also transposed into legal text already before, because the European Union has been adopting, has adopted a, uh, an own initiative report that was based largely on this work I was telling you about, but also on international tools like the tenure guidelines, but also on the work of other fora in Europe that we have also been amending. So it is all trans translated into an own initiative report that recognizes this, that there is land grabbing in Europe, that there's a lot of land concentration, that we are losing farmers, and land is not just a, a commercial asset like, like mobile phones or like any other kind of commercial asset. Land is interesting. Land, land is something that is part of the farmer's life. So this was a very, very huge victory for us. And based on this victory, we started to to, uh, to coin out the possibility of a directive. If you go to the next slide, please. So I would like to present now the key elements of our work. We have been working in the last few years and we have been putting together a document that I think it will be shared with you, which are our political, uh, it is our political proposal, basically on a European directive. And you will find all the details that I'm telling you right now there extensively, but I wanted to share with you some key elements. So basically, our directive is proposed on measures to, first of all, prevent land grabbing and land concentration. Then secondly, to facilitate access to land for peasant farmers, for the next generation, for the youth, for women, uh, especially. So after that, measures to protect soil, because through land access, we also want to promote agroecology and our agroecological point uh, way of working. And then, very important, we also propose and address the problem of common lands and public lands. And, and because it is something neglected right now in Europe, which is so privatized and neoliberal, that we tend to, to lose that, for instance, in Romania, we still have millions of hectares of common land that is through customary rights, through different rights than the, the, 
the, the, the, the, the, the just the buying out the land. And then after that, we also want to propose measures on forests and coastal farming, especially because the reality of the link between the forest and forest management, and this is very well shown by our membership in, in, the, in the north uh, of ECVC, is linked to the land tenure. And it's also the coastal farmers. So if I would like, uh, now I will go through the measures a little bit one by one, try not to push over my time, but just to un understand a few of the, the elements. So when it comes to the measure of preventing land grabbing and land concentration, we very much point out in the directive that we need to focus on the use of land. So the use of land is much more than just property. So it's about renting, uh, it's, about, it's about property also. Uh, it's about shares in companies. So when we amend, when, when we create a directive, a legislation, we need to take in consideration all these different uses of land and to look into who owns land, who uses land according to these, these uh, criteria. So it's very important to create transparency and we are addressing this issue in the, in the first part. Then it's also the transfer of the usage rights that it has to be subject of public regulation. And when it comes to the transfer of usage rights, we also come up with radical proposals that we want to debate. And I'm very happy to debate on it in all fora. One of this is that no natural or legal person shall be granted use rights over land areas larger than 500 hectares. And this very much comes to the reality that we have been looking inside in our membership and in our alliance. And it was very much looking into who are the peasant farmers and the small family farmers of Europe. How much land do they have? And what, how, how is agroecology employed in Europe? So this is something that is coming from our proposal, our, our analysis, and we need, to, we need to work with this because this is a, it's, 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 we need to limit land concentration a lot and to create more democracy in the land market and in, 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 uh, in the way we, we access land. So also that member states that, uh, that, that have a different reality, for instance, Romania, or like you were mentioning, Ukraine, uh, also Mikhailo, and how much does an average small farmer have in Ukraine, uh, can, can use lower ceilings. So it's not like we need to even reach up to the 500 hectares. This is not about fragmentation, but it's about the optimal use of land when it comes to small farming and agroecology. And it's also very important that the prevention is to prevent and stop land grabbing, uh, within and, with, uh, and outside the EU. Now, this is important because we have two countries here that spoke before, uh, and regions, Scotland and, and Ukraine, where EU does fuel land grabbing through its companies, where the neoliberal market was present and was capturing a lot of land, or it has been fueling the same system where lands are being enclosed into bigger and bigger plots. So we need, and ma many times it happens by non-farming uh, uh, actors like banks, like investment funds or pension funds. So we need to stop these actors of, of grabbing more land. And of course, also we need to stop Europe from grabbing land in the other continents like Africa or Asia or South America. So also it's about establishment of a redistribution process in this, uh, in this directive. What do we do with the lands after we do such an, uh, should I say agrarian reform? So where do these lands go? How are these lands managed? How are these lands redistributed to small farmers? So if you can go on, uh, on the presentation. It's also about how to facilitate access to land. So we have special measures dedicated for this. So very important is transparency. We are talking a lot about land, but we don't know who uh, is, is busy, who has land tenure in Europe. So it's a, we, we propose the implementation of national observatories on farmland sales, something that Europe can do, which is doing in other sections like the milk market, the milk uh, system when they monitorize milk and they monitorize many things in Europe and statistically, but not land, not who owns land and not who, who has land and how land transactions are being made. This is something that even journalists have a hard time to discover. So we need more transparency. Also, the value of land, which is highly volatile and, and very disputed in many countries, no, because we have uh, countries like the Netherlands where, where land prices are rocketing. And we have other, other countries where land is cheap. So of course, that, that from the expensive countries, land is being bought in the cheap countries. So we are creating also an intra-communitary grabbing of land because of this volatility. I'm, 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 I'm over time. No, just, uh, if you can speak a little bit more slowly. I'm sorry. Uh... I'm, sorry for the I'm sorry, I got carried away. Okay, um, of course, so then, then we want to base uh, uh, the value of land on the, on the standard output, which is rather something representative for, for farmers. 
uh, but also uh, when it comes to facilitation of land, we need to give priority to the youth and the new farmer, the next generation in buying land. I remember this pyramid, this inverted pyramid that Ross was presenting, and it's kind of the same in the same uh, whole Europe that our farmers are dying out, getting older. So we need a new generation of farmers and we need more of these new people to engage into farming and have access to land. If we can go to the next uh, slide. So it's also about, uh, as I was saying, about agroecological measures and soil protection. And this is very important because uh, peasant agroecology is intrinsically linked with soil quality. Through our practice of peasant agroecology, we are also protecting our soils, keeping humus in, keeping, uh, keeping the natural cycles alive and not destroying through monocropping. So we need to monitor also and observe the quality of the soil. And we have measures proposed towards this so that the soil quality increases. And who are the farmers? Who are increasing soil quality let them have access to land and it's the millions of peasant family farmers of europe so it's also the establishment of um, of plans to improve uh, soil fertility and and health this is very important this is something participative and this is something co-creational with with peasant farmers and then also the participation of farmers and citizens in these uh, restoration programs and very important, it's something that we see in, in, um, in especially Western Europe, it's a lot of land sealing happening. So to prohibit land sealing because of the climatic problems that it, 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 it generates, but also because of the loss of land. And then, um, of course, we propose in this directive that priority to access to land should be given to the farmers who are practicing agroecology. So they should be sure of speaking uh, uh, first-hand buyers of this land, if I just may use one example. Next slide, if you please. Uh, okay, and then I, I was mentioning the, the very importance of the commons. This is something that is, is not measured in Europe. And they are now, Europe is investing money into seeing what, how much common land does Europe have? And it's coming from the history and it's coming from our different histories, but we see common land everywhere in Europe or community owned land or public land. There are different notions. And of course, we need to have an inventory of these lands in order to that we can safeguard these lands for the commoners, for the, for the ones who are using. Me, myself, I'm a small farmer. If I would not have access to the common land, I would not be, uh, not be economically viable. So it's imperative. And in my, in my region, for instance, just in 10 years, we lose half of the common land. Um, okay, then also prohibition and, and uh, prohibition of the privatization of this common land. It's something that is happening in all regions of Europe that come formerly being common land is being bought out or concessioned out to large companies. And this has to stop. Um, if we can go on, yes. And then of course, same goes to the forest land and coastal land as farmland. We need to consider this forest land and coastal land as farmland, which is managed by, by farmers. We see this in our membership in, in the north, how important are forest land and the management of, of, of agroforestry and forestry in general for the livelihood of small farmers, but also to avoid concentration of these forest land and coastal, uh, coastal farms um, and to favor agroecological practices in here too, uh, and to protect their usage rights, which are many times linked to ancestral usage rights or even like um, uh, customary rights, which are very well defined in the tenure guidelines. Uh, okay, and next. All right, so I, I don't know if I'm over time, but I'm definitely reaching my conclusions. So <laughs> I just wanted to, to uh, mention again that our struggle uh, that came really from the grassroots is, is intrinsically connected to the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and other tools like the Tenure Guidelines, which have been developed through us and for us. And this is through this land is our right as peasant farmers and this is why we fight from the grassroots besides occupations besides the struggles and the militant activism we also fight <laughs> in the policy making rooms so that we can have a directive we can have a legislation that is for us is not against us so that is um, that is what is on the table right now and it's shared with you uh, and i think it's a good example uh, of how this this is a land issues are universal and we can also approach these land issues through policy making from our grassroots organizations, nonetheless of where we are based, just looking at our own realities. And then also, uh, I have to mention that this is still in a, in a conceptual work, which is still in progress. 
because when we are creating a bottom-up approach, it's very important to always reconnect with our grassroots, with our peasant farmers and constituencies, so that we can always benchmark through them and through us if we are doing heading for towards the right direction. And this is why all this is very much up to debate and up to our, our construction. And then, of course, with the constructions, so constructions with our strategic allies, which are human rights uh, organizations or which are uh, scholar, activist scholars and so on, which are helping us all the way. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward for the debate and uh, uh, I hope I was clear enough. Merci beaucoup, Attila. C'était parfait. Thank you, Attila. That was really good. We have a few questions in the Q&A tool. Some of them have already been answered. As Attila spoke recently, I would just ask if he can answer Alberto's question, who didn't quite understand the standard coefficient production. Would you be able to explain that in a few words? I'm sorry, yes, I was, uh, I, I had a little bit of a internet lag. Uh, sure, so it was a question about the standard output. Uh, uh, yes, um, so in Europe, in the European Union, uh, when, when policymakers are developing policies, they used to use the, the EDU or UDE, which is the economic dimension unit. So it was basically a number that was calculated on, on different coefficients, uh, which summed up uh, an economic unit, an economic uh, dimension of a farm. So it was not the size of the farm. It was not the, it was a, a correlation between the production on the farm, but also the size and other factors. And this uh, very much favors the large farms. So just to see, give an example, in Romania, small farms uh, receive this edu coefficient in a way that they, they, it, it prohibited them access to the European funds. And these were millions of peasant farmers which didn't uh, manage to, to, to get access to, to European public funds because they were considered too small as economic. So the standard output is the average monetary value of agricultural production at farm gate price. So it's, it's uh, in, in euros per hectare or per head of livestock. So this much, very much more links back to the reality of the farmers on, on what they produce and on, on their economic dimension from the farm, not calculated to other kind of like correlated dimensions that the, the EU bureaucrats tend to do. So this much more, uh, this much more advantages farmers and much more reflects the reality of, uh, of, of the farming and, and it's kind of like, um, uh, let's say economic viability, how, how well they, they and not, it's not, not related to large farmers, but it's much more related to small farmers because small farmers often get overlooked uh, when they are doing these economic calculations. So I'm, I'm not sure if I was completely <laughs> clear on this, but we do have an asterisk in the political document where it's also explained. Okay, merci. J'espère que pour Alberto, du coup, ça. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. Um, I'll give the floor to Andre, Andre in a minute, uh, but we just have a couple more questions about Rosa's presentation. There are a couple of questions, so I would ask her to be quite brief if she can. One of the participants was wondering if you can talk about the community land buyout. And one of the participants would like you to talk about the evolution of property and free occupation of land. Um, she didn't quite understand that part. So just explain in a couple of words. And then I'll let Elias ask a question at the end. I'll give you the floor, uh, Rose, to answer these two questions. Thanks, Audrey. Um, yeah, the question about Langham, Langham uh, that's a a community 
that bought a large estate off uh, the Buclou Estates, which is a, a traditional estate who owns a lot of land in Scotland. Um, they recently purchased, I think, over a thousand hectares of land in the south of Scotland. Um, and they, um, they are, are currently uh, sort of developing what they're going to do with the land. It's interesting, actually, I'm, I'm also doing research. Uh, I'm doing a PhD on the, at the moment on community land ownership in Scotland and um, had asked uh, all of the community landowners what agricultural activity they were doing on their land. Um, and Langham responded and said that they they wouldn't classify what they are doing with their land as agricultural because they're doing more kind of biodiversity and woodland management on their land. So despite the fact that it was um, uh, kind of hill farming previously, they're sort of changing and shifting the the land use of um, of the land that they've purchased. And I think that's partly to do with, or well, I, I don't know why, but um, uh, to speculate that the subsidy system at the moment is currently um, under review and it's not clear whether they would still receive subsidies for agricultural work on the land and um, the income that they would get is marginal. So they're looking at different ways of managing that land. Um, but it's a really interesting case uh, and quite a high profile political one because the Buclew Estates are such a powerful landowner in Scotland. Um, and such a large landowner in Scotland. Um, and I did want to touch on this point about whether it's about ownership or use um, as being important because I saw that coming up in the chat. And um, it's quite interesting in the case with, with Scotland that um, there's, the community land ownership does create quite a strong argument for um, the ownership of land to be in the hands of local people because the decisions that they make then are better and the economic benefits uh, do go to the local community then. So as long as there's a democratic structure um, for the local community to own the land, it does actually make a difference that they are the landowners. And um, uh, yeah, so, but I think land ownership and land use, are they're not like an either or, it's, uh, important to consider both um, and it's important to think about how to incentivize good land use practices and fair land use practices despite the owner as well because some of the community landowners um, uh, are still incentivized to, to do land use practices that are most economically viable for them and so that often might not mean farming um, because at the moment they can't benefit from it they have to have strong values around uh food sovereignty and agroecology to want to do that um so yeah it's i don't think it's an either or it's a, it, a it's something to treat holistically um i'm afraid i didn't quite understand the other question from edith i wonder if she can elaborate on it Edith, could you write your question directly, um, maybe slightly more clearly? Um, I'll, I'll try and let you speak through the microphone. Uh, thank you. I was wondering if you could go back. You were talking about people with free land. Uh, at one point in your speech and you said that they could occupy the land and cultivate the land. I don't know if I understood that correctly. And I, I think I, I was missing something. Where does this land come from? Was it land that was abandoned by large farmers? I, I didn't understand that, but don't worry if it's too complicated. Uh, is that any clearer, Rose? Um, I'm not sure. Um, did you mean with the historical, like uh, when 
the example that I was giving or the story that I was telling at the beginning about the communities that were displaced from their land or, or a more recent thing. Because um it was when the agricultural reform was being implemented. I think at one point you said there was a, a movement, but don't worry about it. I'll, I'll listen to your speech again and I think that will be okay. I don't want to take any more time. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, someone is saying uh, from Tadelia in the chat that maybe it was about the the first land reform regulation, which um, which gave the right to roam. We, oui. uh, yeah. So that is um, not necessarily about farming, but just allows people the right to walk anywhere um, on any private property, uh, and it's it's not about farming but it's ah, culturally very okay. significant because okay, it's kind of okay. Merci. shifting yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. it kind of okay. shifts, shifts how we think about land and shifts the cultural like sense of uh, people having a right to enjoy responsibly all of our land um and uh rather than like it, it kind of breaks the barrier a bit of private land ownership um, you know, in England, there's signs everywhere that are like private property, you can't walk here. And that doesn't exist in Scotland. And so mentally and culturally for people in Scotland, that makes a big difference in how we think about what land is for and who should be able to access it. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's not directly about farming, but it's really significant. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think Edith is happy with that answer. Thank you, Iris. Now I'll open the floor to debate and for questions and responses to the speeches. We've had quite a lot of responses in the chat box already. We have uh, colleagues from Brazil also participating in the webinar and who would like to react to the presentations. So if Monica would like to take the floor. Is that good? Hello, good morning to everybody. My name is Alaya. I'm the director of uh, agriculture politics. Audrey, it's just to say this, the following. I didn't um, pay much attention to the presentations of uh, our colleagues, and I understood that there's a very big similarity in relation to the, the land use in Brazil. We also have here that question, the, in all the regions of Brazil, we, we have the question about agri of lands, and especially in the uh, Amazon, Amazonian region, where there are many public lands, there are a very large volume of public lands, which we also, we don't know. Sorry, we just have a, an issue with translators in French. There are, there are two people interpreting into French at the same time. Indirectly, how some of them are being exploited. Um, and their uh, um, environmental impact. And there are huge agricultural companies who are arriving and occupying those lands. They are taking advantage of the, uh, the 
current land policies and they are worried about um, becoming owners of that land. And in this case, it sometimes happens that um, f uh, family uh, farmers are um, thrown off the, off the lands that they are farming and preserving. And therefore, this generates a lot of violence. We have some brutal violence, such as murders of people and uh, families being thrown off their land. And there is there are people opposing these things. However, you know, they're earning money from the government and from public funds. Also, at the end of last year, we had, we, are, we, we approved uh, a resolution, which brings us Uh, the, the need to discuss in more detail the, the agricultural land use in Brazil in all in the whole country, not just in Amazonia. And in reality, that resolution, um, apart from people discussing things such as respecting the communities, traditional communities, we, we also try to uh, propose that the, 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 um, the land ownership should be limited in Brazil. This is quite, we know that this is quite a difficult um, proposal and there needs to be a lot of debate about it. But we need to pressure the government to apply this, especially um, in relation to the presidency in Brazil. With the possibility of having Lula being re-elected in Brazil, we need to deepen uh, the discussion and, and propose the limitation of ownership. And the agricultural reform doesn't just affect people in Brazil. We also need to discuss the, the land, the agricultural reform, the wider agricultural reform. And, and later on, you know, that's something that can be discussed in more detail. And Alberto cannot be here today. He's outside Brazil, Brasilia, Brasilia. And I'm here with Monica and Ivo, who are, and Monica, who are also participating. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Oui, j'en profite effectivement pour annoncer que la prochaine discussion thématique. I would just like to take this opportunity to say, oh, sorry. Okay, that should be better for the interpreters. So I would like to say that the next themed discussion at the forum will be co-organized by our colleagues from Brazil, uh, especially on agricultural reforms and um, financing of agricultural land. So we'll be able to come back to these examples in Latin America in a bit more depth. Now, I think uh, Philippe wanted to ask uh, some questions and react to some different speeches. I need to find Philippe. Okay, here. Philippe? Yes, hello, can you hear me? 
Okay. Hi and yeah, greetings Hola. to all. A todos, especialmente a nuestro amigo Mikhailo de Ucrania. Pela situação tão difícil, agradecemos muito a sua presença. Acho que esta é uma discussão muito interessante. Muito obrigada, Mikhail e a Tila, pelas, pelas suas contribuições. Então, a primeira apresentação, a primeira pergunta era é, o que falou Ross sobre os créditos de carbono. To buy pie lands. And I was just thinking, yeah, you know, kind of, um, yeah, in, do we need additional tools to kind of, yeah, protect from, from, from those dynamics? Or, um, and, and also specifically asking Attila, like in the context of the EU directive, if, if that is something that you think is already considered, or if there are like specific things that need to be taken into account. So that would be the first question. The second, one um, was a bit also was to Attila on one of the things that you said um, on the directive, and I don't know if I understood that correctly. But when you were speaking about coastal areas and forests, that they should be included in like agricultural land, so they should be kind of in that directive. And my my question is, if that doesn't kind of re create risks of yeah, I don't know, opening up those areas which might sometimes be like, you know, fragile ecosystems as well and so on to kind of also kind of open them up, not only for peasant use, but also like potentially for investments. Um, that's that's a question or like how you would in a way balance that, you know, kind of use, but kind of sustainable use, not exploitation, not destruction. That was, that's a question. And the third one is just um, coming to the issue that, you know, many, many land deals take also, to the shape of you know they are financial transactions they're not necessarily um, you know real land transactions i think that has been a, a challenge for 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 a while that um yeah these land acquisitions in a way they kind of circumvent regulations because you know it's people companies don't buy lands but they share buy shares of companies that own land for example and that eff effectively you know in the end that's a land deal but it's legally it's it's not so um, I just wonder, like, what your thoughts are on, like, how to what extent, let's say, a, a specific land regulation, be it national, like in Scotland, or be it European wide, um, can actually give a sufficient answer to that problem, or is it if there is also, let's say, in parallel, you know, work to be done on, you know, more financial regulation, uh, which is obviously kind of a big world on its own and very complex, but but I just kind of you know, how do we deal with those kinds of things? And is that, you know, is the directive enough for that? Or do we need the directive plus we need more effective financial regulation? Um, yeah. So any, any, any thoughts from any of the panelists would be welcome. And thanks again. Really, really great discussion. Thanks. Okay, merci beaucoup, Stéphane. Uh, je sais pas. Qui des panélistes veut prendre la main Je pense qu'il y avait une première question qui s'adressait à Rose concernant les, les crédits carbone, il me semble. Je ne sais pas si les marchés carbone. Euh, si tu veux y aller, Rose. Il y a Tila ensuite, je vois qu'il lève la main. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, sorry, I, I was um, out of the English channel for translation, so I didn't catch what you said, but. Um... I'll go ahead. <laughs> um, thanks, Stefan, for some really great questions. Um, um, last year, I was working a lot on the, on the Land Workers Alliance uh, presence at COP26, and um, their part of the Via Campesina uh, campaign was very much to say a no to carbon markets and carbon credit schemes and um, that the, the UN FCC um, should not uh, like allow these schemes to happen. And that, that is one strategy, but unfortunately they're here um, and they're really real and um, they're very unregulated in the UK at the moment. And there's, there's no regulation kind of allowed in as voluntary schemes 
uh, and yeah, there's no effective regulation of them. And um, I think that's why they are sort of causing quite a lot of uh, speculation. Um, several members of the Land Workers Alliance uh, report that agents uh, who want to sell carbon credits are literally coming to farm doors and knocking on farmers' doors and saying, why don't you sell your carbon to me? I can give you a really good price. Um, and it's really problematic because then the farmer loses the right to claim the credits. And at the moment, uh, because of the vacuum we have in the, in the subsidy system in the UK, because of withdrawal from the EU and uh, being still in a phase where we're um, creating our new subsidy system, farmers are, are potentially signing away their, their ability to claim um, carbon, uh, the carbon sequestration practices that they're doing, which might in the future risk them not being able to, to benefit from the future subsidy packages if they're framed around carbon sequestration. Um, so it's a, a really huge problem that's moving very quickly. Um, I would like a moratorium to happen on this uh, in the UK, but I think that's very unlikely. Um, and yeah, I do think um, we we do need effective regulation of them. Um, and uh, and farmers need a lot more uh, kind of like education and support in analysing the current offers that are there and understanding how signing up to these carbon credit schemes at the moment might be a disadvantage for the future for themselves, depending on how the subsidy system um, uh, rolls out. Um, yeah, I'm not really an expert on how they should be regulated, but I think it's definitely worth considering for the EU directive as well, whether there's, um, whether there's things that need to be included in that to take into consideration the, the carbon markets, because it's, it's not just happening in the UK, it's, it happens everywhere. And it, it's been happening in the global south um, for, for a lot longer as well. Um, and I forgot your other question. Maybe yeah, until I can go and I'll come back to it. On peut, oui, effectivement, laisser Attila peut-être compléter. Et puis... Yes, maybe Attila can finish the answer and I'll check the rest of the questions in the chat. Uh, Attila, I'll let you finish off. And, and then we had a question about the directive, but I think you may have already written that down. Sure. Um, yes. So just to say, indeed, as Raz was saying, that uh, the that ECVC has has been very critical of the carbon market mechanism and the carbon farming initiative, uh, and our our main approach was that land is is for for food production and for small farmers and for agroecology. And through agroecology, we already uh, do our job of of being good farmers for the climate. Um, and also it's very dangerous because of this uh, private funding that is being poured into the carbon farming initiative. Basically, they want to conceive payments uh, that are, are coming from private companies to, to that uh, somehow through these the private companies offset their, uh, their kind of like emissions. So, but we were very strong against it. But I have to say indeed that the land directive work was conceived before uh, the carbon farming initiative took very much shape. Uh, and momentum. So it's a very, very good point, actually, that we need to more address the situation of this. We have addressed it already a bit, I think, on when, when you read the longer text, but also I think we would need to be more specific, and especially because we see how much carbon carbon crediting has been detrimental, for instance, to these red and red plus uh, approaches globally. And we definitely do not want this uh, to be transposed into the farming system. And we already see the big farmers jumping on this uh, uh, because it's a new opportunity for financing for them and so on. But but definitely we need to address it and we would be quite against uh, carbon farming and carbon credits. So when it comes to the um, uh, coastal areas and forests, indeed, I did not have enough maybe time or I didn't express it completely. The fact that it, it, it does come on uh, on the preserving on the of the of the use of uh, rights of individuals and communities that are traditionally engaged into small scale artisanal and, and coastal agriculture. Uh, uh, and it's about also 
that the, the directive doesn't somehow abolish this kind of like uh, the protection of these uh, environments that are that, that are very sensitive um, when it comes to like the large scale development of like tourism or recreational activities or so on. So it does it does uh, it do, the, the the focus is on the on the small scale uh, artisanal and coastal agriculture and the, the usage rights which are like taken out. And uh, a lot of the people are losing their lands, actually coastal lands, because of the big developments. So it, it, it's for this. And maybe indeed we need to work more on the text to better highlight this. And the same goes with, with, uh, with forestry. Well, actually, we do mention that, uh, uh, that we need to keep the good balance between, um, well, and, uh, and the, uh, between the agroforestry and the forest lands. But this is much more also about the tenure rights of the, of the, of the farmers, small farmers, for instance, but not just from the from the north, um, it's about securing their rights in a space where a lot of the forests are being liberalized, uh, forest agro forest lands, and we do need to look into how in the north small farmers are are using the forests um, in a very agroecological way in order to be economically viable. For instance, having cattle roaming the forest, but in a in a very interesting way, it's 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 fascinating to see, and it needs to be preserved, not clear cut forestry or like really uh, closed uh, big forest concentrated lands, which also we see in Romania. So this needs to stop. So um, we do specifically engage into these problematics into the directive, but I didn't have time to to explain it. And and because you highlight it, it means that we need to dwell more time to to just like uh, like coin out even better uh, and then um, about the financial mechanisms well um, it's indeed the directive does uh, talk also about the different kind of like models of property or and tenure and one is the shared deals uh, and also it's about the land observatory so it's about like creating transparency about who owns land and who accesses land uh, but definitely that there are financial mechanisms that need to go hand in hand to be changed also uh, so that we can completely address this and yes the financial vehicle of europe is huge and complex uh, and with many loopholes that we need much more um, also on the financial side to be regulated but that we do touch it quite extensively because we do want to create more transparency uh, over also these shared deals so that we there is no need for Europe who owns land, uh, which financial institutions, and how do how is the uh, land, uh, flowing money flowing into farmland? And one of the other aspects I just finish off is the aspect of the cap, uh, and the cap also uh, in in parallel with the, the developing a, a directive, we also need to we well we need a better cap, uh, which doesn't pour uh, money into area based subsidies. And it doesn't fuel the same concentration, especially that we see in countries, for instance, like Hungary, it was actually created the transparency over how these subsidies ended up in oligarchy, which is like the, the money farmers. <laughs> so, yes, um, very important aspects. And thank you, Philip, for raising that. And that gives us more space for the debate in the future. Thank you, Attila. So Rose has also written another answer in the chat with regards to transparency. And I will give the floor to Mikhailo. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just short like in interruption in the your know, discussion to actually European Union and directive, but uh, as you may know, Ukraine like applied uh, to join EU like as soon as possible, but uh, even before Ukraine has done a lot of like uh, activities to implement a lot of European directives, for example, nitrate directive, and actually it's more about agricultural pollution, pollution of environment by uh, agricultural facilities, and we were like three years in struggle to implement the standards of nitrate directive in ukraine so in any case we are expecting that the uh, eu land directive will like push ukrainian land relations in better way and uh, i agree with Attila that cap for example not not good instrument or tool uh, in some ways but even these tools is like really 
good for Ukraine <laughs> in any case. So we, yeah, we should, uh, of course, we should like uh, improve this uh, as soon as possible to do it more effective and more responsible and accountable, etc. But uh, for Ukraine, all the stuff is good and we are ready yeah, to implement this. And uh, of course, sometimes it's much slower than we want. Uh, I mean, uh, civil society wants to, to be more quick, faster in implementation European standards and push uh, business, especially agribusiness, to implement these higher standards, best available agricultural practices, including land practices. So everything else will be and is important for Ukraine. It's like a good experience for us. Thank you. Thank you. El Kabir, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I don't have any questions to ask, but I just want to remind you that in the discussion, I want to bring your attention to the importance of a community or collective land in Morocco, which is currently more than 15 million hectares. There isn't much to say about it. But I do want to say that we need all of you to safeguard this land and to fight in solidarity because the state is currently establishing laws to grab this land and give it to private companies. So, I have a suggestion I'm the person in charge of our organization, which is um, interested in the land, and I'm organizing an activity, maybe it could be a, a conference or a round table remotely. And I would like to suggest this initiative to you to the organizations who can participate and plead at an international level. We don't have resources. Could the forum or your secretariat put the technical resources in place? So Zoom and YouTube and everything. Um, so that's everything that I wanted to say. Thank you. So I did see that you were participating in the discussion forum and highlighting the situation of the new law, which is being implemented to grab community land. I think one of my colleagues wanted to suggest a video, a kind of interview video, and I can say that we'll finish the discussion with, with this, but we can keep talking about this on the website, um, on this topic. Um, there are lots of things happening in the chat as well. We still need to keep talking about this, and that's what the forum has been made for. So we invite you to discuss and bring your ideas and experiences on the website. We'll um, make a global summary of all the discussions, but you're still in time to bring all of your analyses and your experiences. With regards to the technical resources, um, I'll get back to you more personally to see what we can contribute to this activity. Um, 
I think someone else put their hand up. I think Emmanuel. Oui, bonjour, vous m'entendez? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So If I've understood properly, the European Directive wants to fight against land grabbing and, and concentration of finances and also encourage agricultural practices for a circular economy. But my question is as follows. So, would this European directive impose states to implement transparent analyses and publications and, and reach the objectives? But I think that the law about financial management belongs to the states. So. Can the European Union impose each country to implement a, a minimum figure on the land? Thank you. And I also have a financial regulation proposal, which isn't on the website. But maybe uh, Fanny can share that with everyone. Thank you. Maybe I can address a little bit the question of Emmanuel. I just uh, I was a little bit uh, lost in translation, but uh, I understand Emmanuel was also like me speaking very fast. <laughs> uh, and um, so yes, I think when it comes to the obliga ob obligativity of of a directive, so the, the 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 reason why we propose and know and we choose the directive and for instance not a regulation because a regulation, a European regulation, has to be uh, implemented uh, per word, no, per like it, it has to be uh, ad literam. So it's it, it's it's not really um, taking on consideration the diversity of, of the land tenure in, in, in Europe. So that's why directive, which is direct, basically, uh, European countries, in order to, to amend their land legislation, so to take in consideration the European level uh, directives, but amend their land legislation based on their uh, this based on their realities. And yes, we have different realities, uh, and we have been sharing these realities. The reality from Romania is not the same as the reality in Belgium, for instance, when it comes to land tenure, because of the proportion of ownership and tenureship, for instance, for one price. Uh, also, when it comes to transparency, you no, know, we we have huge problems in Romania. Maybe. Maybe Belgium has a better market. I don't know. Let's not even talk about other mar like land markets, like like France, for instance, which already have a mechanism like the Safer, which works, as I understand, uh, in a different way, for instance, and other countries try to implement it and so on. So there are different realities. And a directive is addressing all these realities. That's why, for instance, just to give an example, the 500 hectare, yes, it is an absolute, recommend, uh, absolute uh, figure, but if the reality is in Romania that we can lower the threshold even more, then there is a possibility to it, to the directive. Uh, it's not a possibility to go over it. So it does give some interpretation, um, but not a lot. And it also respects the, the diversity of the state. So I think that's an obligativity. Um, and uh, it's a long way to see, because as you see, I share, we share with you the key elements proposal, which this is like the key political proposals that are behind our, our consideration of a land directive. 
And all this needs to be transformed also, also into legal language, something as a process as we are doing, working with uh, legal experts in order to create a, a legal draft, a completely legal draft that can be um, sort of put also in the in the in the in the legislative debate, which obviously then formulation is very important uh, also for the after that for the implementation. It's a long road. It's a long road, and I, and then yes, uh, this is what I can say for now. That until now we have been uh, dreaming out our dream directive. That's what we say. It's coming from our realities, our needs and hopes, and it's a long road to see now how we can make our dream come true uh, by really pushing for lawmakers to to on European level to make it true. And they need to find also the legal um, the legal language to oblige this new reality that we are hoping for. So, and we are pushing them from behind. I'm not, I'm not, I'm sure that it's not completely satisfying Emmanuel what I'm saying, but this is what I can share until now. Um, yes, so maybe I address that. Uh, and on the, on the second one, I'm sorry, I didn't understand on the financial thing. Oui, un grand merci uh, à toi, Attila. Donc, uh, j'ai... Thank you, Attila. So, if I understand correctly, it's an invitation to states to be transparent and adapt minimums, for example, 500 hectares per farm. But if I understand correctly, it would be that each country, nation, region, which would adapt, adopt measures adapted to the regional situation, whether that's in France, or, or in Belgium. If I understand correctly, we need to attack from top up and bottom up. We need to take measures and act regionally so our regions can stop land grabbing by business and etc. So that's what we're doing. Thank you, Attila, for your answer. The European Financial Directive is a, a European framework, but each national legislation, of course, we're hoping for each of them to go further than the framework. So our big difficulty is given the different regulations which aren't the same level from one country to another, we need to bring everyone up, but we hope that national regulations will go further than this European financial directive. It's just a collective and common framework. And the documents that, that you've sent from your organization We'll ask uh, coordination to see how we can publish that on the website. Don't worry about that. Okay, perfect. I, I put it in the chat box. It's not very easy to read. There's a six page PDF and Word document. What, mail, what email address should I send it to? Uh, Manuel, you already shared a document. We, we've got your email, so we'll sort that out. It's specific to the to the French and Belgian context. That's exactly the place to share experiences and, and propositions from each background, so it'll be very welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's five minutes past four, so we'll bring this closing co conference to an end. Thank you to the panelists for your wonderful speeches. I know there have been lots of questions and, and debates that we've seen in the in the chat box. We haven't been able to read them all live, um, but we will do this on the the page dedicated to this discussion on the web page. We'll also send you a summary email so you can see all of the video conferences because the access links aren't um, obvious for everyone. 
we'll also send links to the discussion and resources pages. As I was saying, the forum began in July last year. It's made up of five themed meetings, such as access uh, for women and finance, which is our current topic. And then the next themed topic will deal with the agricultural reform. It will have the same format. It will be a video conference with a space to discuss. You can put your questions on the web page to better construct this closing conference. Um, we'll also suggest steps for action. So that will be in July. Um, we're also working on the different formats that we'll be able to do this in. As you'll have understood, this discussion isn't over. You can keep contributing um, and get ready for the next themed discussion. Thank you to everyone. Sorry, I've not had the time to read the questions which are arriving now. You need to subscribe to the, the forum website. I'll ask my colleague to put the, the website link. It's in English, French, Spanish and Portuguese with instant translation. And on the forum, you can exchange easily between each other, um, people from different countries and people who speak different languages. Thank you, everyone. Rana has just sent the link to the website so you can um, sign up to the list and for the newsletter and you can receive all of the information on the activities in the forum. Thank you everyone. Goodbye. Thank you and good luck Misha and Attila. Thank you Misha. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.